Welcome everybody to this session. We're going to look at the future of education and with me online um, in Malaysia today, I believe Stuart Patton, the global CEO of ACED Venture, a series of companies that we'll find out more about. Um, but really he calls himself sort of an ecosystem architect. Is that right, Stuart? That's correct, Mike. Ecosystem architect. How are you doing today? I'm very good, sir. Other than being trapped in our apartments, we're all doing well. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, uh, I think that's, that's what we're doing at the moment. We're living life a different way. So let's kick that off. Not only are you and I trapped in our apartments, um, there's a whole bunch of students trapped in apartments around the world. And uh, that may continue for some time yet. I know in South Africa, they're talking about it even possibly being the remainder of the year. And then that's got the possibility of changing education as we know it. So with that in mind, why don't you give us some background firstly on Stuart Patton and uh, then Ace Adventure as well and what that does. So let's start with you. Okay, so, so basically my background is, uh, I'm not from an education background. My background is uh, I came into uh, the working world as a design engineer. Uh, I went up uh, through the management um, some different spheres, uh, ended up being in charge of what's called corporate business development uh, of a large manufacturing company, which in essence got me out to the Asian marketplace. So we were building factories in China, we were sourcing products in China, and we were looking to take those things back into the European uh, manufacturing field. So um, I was doing that for 20 odd years, and then I um, came back to the UK after spending three years in Asia uh, and decided that um, I shouldn't be back in the UK. It was all happening in Asia. And that was literally 20, almost 20 years ago now um, because I saw the growth happening here, not back in the UK. So, um, and when I came back here, I was uh, first of all in Hong Kong. I was uh, business development director for a large company in Hong Kong, looking at US products into China. I eventually moved to uh, Indonesia, where I was doing business coaching uh, with Indonesian companies, one of which I then moved into to take over as managing director, which was a um, mobile company. And off the back of the mobile company, I met with uh, EdTech guys from Finland who were looking to bring education from Finland into, Malay sorry, into Indonesia. Uh, using mobile platforms. And that was my introduction, should I say, to education about six years ago. So from there, I formed a company in Finland with a business partner. We set up a company in um, Hong Kong. We brought Finnish EdTech products into Asia through Hong Kong. And about two years ago, I started working more closely with, uh, with Ann Tam uh, here in Malaysia, who owns the Ace uh, Adventure Group, which is a group of international schools. Now I've known Ann probably for eight years. And my first experience of uh, Anne's school group was when I went to meet her, um, introduced by, by a, um, a friend of ours. I had a meeting with Anne, and then uh, Anne said to me, go along to the staff canteen, or the, so the kids canteen, as it then and it was, just sit down, get some food, I'll be there in five minutes and we'll have a you know, further conversation. So I walk into the canteen, <clears throat> and it was completely empty, like a school canteen, just trestle tables everywhere. I got some food, I sat down, and probably within 20 seconds of me sitting down, two small boys sat next to me, and the whole place was empty. So I've got one boy sat in front of me, one next to him, and I was thought, wow, I was kind of uncomfortable. What's, what's going on here? And these two kids started asking me questions, you know, where are you from, what are you doing, and you know, uh, nice of you to be here, thank you for visiting our school. I was blown away by, these kids are so confident, these kids are so mature, and it's like 12 year old boys. And that was a, my introduction to the ACE education system, as it were, eight years ago, where they were taking, you could say, average students, if that's the term I can use, but moving them through an, an, an extraordinary system to develop them in a, in a different way. Now, that, that was my connection to Anne eight years ago, and since then, we've been in contact. And then two years ago, I started doing more work with her, and then a year ago, I talked about wanting to come and join her here in Malaysia, and help take her business to the next level. Because I have a, I have a belief that we should do more things for education. Uh, education is really 
super important for the future. And if you see all the issues now in the world with the problems of the environment, global warming, and even just all the other internal issues we're facing, if we don't give kids the preparation they need for the future, then we're letting ourselves down as well. I mean, it's a poor legacy to leave for them. So my goal is now to, to try and get to a situation with the company that we can make a big difference in education in the right sort of way. That's fantastic. And let's just talk about a little bit about the scope now, eight years later, yeah. of the Ace Adventure group of companies, different uh, places. It's got its fingers in the pie. And um, just so to give our listeners a perspective on you know, how dynamic this organisation is. So um, let's start. There's kindergarten schools. Tell, tell us all about it. Okay. So, well, it, the, 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 the analogy I use is that, is that uh, Anne started this whole system from her kitchen table. Well, she did. She started teaching from a kitchen table 24 years ago. So this was basically, she created the acorn, as it were. And, we, and the acorn was then planted in the ground. And from, from this acorn grew a tree. Now, the, the roots of the tree, she got mentor, support, and help to make sure these trees roots are really strong. And then the first tree grew. So, so, so when I came in, my analogy was, uh, as I explained, that's why I, I described the company this way. My analogy now is to grow the forest uh, in terms of making it a much, much bigger solution. So they started, Anne started her system from a secondary school first. Um, they went secondary school, primary school, now we've opened kindergarten. So there are our three verticals. So now we, we're now moving those, loca- those uh, systems into different locations. But what we added on to the, um, the secondary school is we're now building an academy. And the whole focus of these schools is to develop entrepreneurial skills. So our niche is entrepreneurial education. Now we still use the the Cambridge system, which is a standard system used in most parts of Asia. So students still do IGSCs and A-levels, et cetera. But the backbone to what they do is done along the, the, the focus of a platform of entrepreneurship. So kids from a very young age will learn about not just how to run a business, but skills like collaboration, creativity, uh, working together, uh, all the sort of soft skills that are now required. And our goal with our ecosystem is to move from schools into academies, into real businesses. So the kids we bring through this system end up running real businesses. Now I've been involved for quite some time with startup companies in Finland. Um, and one of the problems we have with startup companies is some is a great idea, but it's their first ever idea. And they're thinking it's the best ever idea. And when you try and work with them to develop it, it's more difficult because they're, they're quite new to some situations, they're new to business perhaps, or maybe they're a great technical person but no marketing skills, or a great marketing person but no, you know, except no technical skills. Now these kids who will come through the system we're talking about, by the time they're 16, will probably have had five or six companies, success and failures, doesn't really matter, but they've got experience. So we imagine we then take them through an academy for three years, and by the time they get to the end of the academy, they can go into an incubator accelerator. They've probably had 10 different companies. Now their skill set, their experience, their knowledge, if you want to invest in somebody, you invest in those guys. And that's, that's the top end of our ecosystem. So as they develop new skills and learn new skills, we feed that back into the schooling system. So we make the whole thing organic. That's the whole concept. That's why it's called, well, that's why I'm called ecosystem architect how to make this whole thing organic and feed back on itself and grow. It's a stunning ecosystem that you guys are developing. I mean, I've never um, been to a school where so many of the teachers um, came out uh, products of the school and so many of the parents are sending their kids there. It's just, it's layer upon layer upon layer and, and the way people around the world are stepping up to help. It, it means you've definitely got education I wouldn't say right, because that would be pretentious, but you're definitely well, well ahead of any curve of getting it right. And I think that um, the fundamentals here is that you've got an ecosystem. Yes, I'll talk so you can drink your coffee. It's very good of me, I know. So um, the fundamentals of the ecosystem is based around that solid Cambridge structure in the middle, which is you know top end um, in terms of curriculum. And then around that, you've got uh, two other ecosystems, if you like, which is 
um, I'll call it the, the business, the mind and the spirit. So you cover all of those sort of things there. And we'll come back to that and talk about that a little bit more um, later on if you wish to. I want to get into the, the current situation around the world at the moment. And that's the a lot of kids are sitting at home. Um, a lot of parents don't know what to do with their kids. Uh, a lot of parents are trying to run their businesses and jobs from home, just like you and I are. Um, but unlike you and I who have space to do that, they don't have space to do that. So what sort of a strain at present is this putting on um, the educational services, schools, principals, teachers, et cetera? And what, what do you see for the, the medium term, the next six to 12 months in terms of um, the effect of the coronavirus and the change of mindset that's happening around the planet? Okay. I think, Mike, if, if I could to, to, to uh, cause you know, I'm a visual guy. Okay. Yep. So I'm going to start with a little bit of symbology. Okay. Because I, because I, I was explaining this to somebody today, so I'm going to use the same thing. So, so I want to do it in this, this very simple format. This is, this is how education's always been. This is certainty. Education has always been a certain, a certain um, environment. And education is based on what we did in the past will happen in the future. That's been education. Whereas the real world is chasing at a much, much faster pace. So the difference is education is very, we can call this certain, okay? let's call this certain. So the square is certainty. But now the real world is uncertainty. It looks more like this. Now, the problem is education is a long way from this. It's still here. So, so, the, so the, the situation then is, if I look at the world where it needs to be now, this is how uncertainty has lived in education. Hardly at all, okay? Little tiny bit. But yeah. now, education has to look like this. You mm -hmm. still need certainty. If it's uncertainty, it's going to be no, it'll be too anxious to people. You'll still need certainty. But... Now certainty is on the inside, uncertainty is on the outside, because that's what's going to happen. So the minds has to change how we do things. So if you think how this then transfers to, to what's happened, is suddenly, suddenly you're going to go from a situation where teachers have been teaching in a classroom to now they're teaching children remotely. Now, we, we've had a bit of an advantage in the sense that in our system, because we've already had lots of online teaching uh, as a back system in the event of uh, air pollution problems coming over from Indonesia once a year, because usually once a year the school closes for two weeks and the kids go home. So we already have a system to fall back into. But that system now, of course, is still using things like, you know, Zoom or, or Google Classrooms or Microsoft, and some of those systems now are being strained. But the difference is now when you're teaching somebody who's in a home environment, it's completely different. The interaction is different. But the key is to work out how to get the engagement. And one of the things our teachers are great at is building engagement with students. Now, if you're not good at that, if, you're, if your skill set is just delivering content every day of a lesson plan, you know, so next class, lesson plan, next class, lesson plan, you'll find it super difficult. Even if you're a younger teacher who gets the, the, uh, you know, the IT side. But many older teachers are also suffering now because they don't understand IT. And if you think about it, kids today, who are in primary or secondary, they will be online a lot more outside school than they will be inside school. So to them, it's not an issue. The issue yep. is the teachers and the systems and the schools. Now, that's well, it's very interesting. And very interesting. I'll, I'll pick up a, a major point that you've said there. You've said that really education of the future has to be far more engagement based than yep. ever before. I know when I went to school and you and I are a similar age, I know when I went to school, you know, you were basically living in your own mind in the classroom because what was being going on at the front of the classroom in most subjects was so damn boring because they were just um, chant learning you on pre-prescribed answers to questions so that you would actually pass an exam. But yeah. um, I know definitely having spent a lot of time at, uh, at the Ace Adventure schools, um, that doesn't happen there. It's incredibly... Um, immersive i guess is the right word that i want to use and that immersion now has to come out online so so let me ask you this what do you think because that's there's some huge challenges here and and we have a we have a client just to pre premise the question 
we have a client in Australia and she's one of the leading people in the world at understanding space. And uh, she works primarily with universities to give students a better experience through the sp physical space of the university. And of course, she's got to do that now um, more importantly than ever because universities will want to attract people back into physical space. But not only that, um, universities like I believe one of the big universities in, Mel in Melbourne in Australia um, is actually looking at the budget it was going to spend for upgrading its buildings and now going to shift it to upgrading its IT platforms so it can deliver, you know, and I'm talking hundreds of millions of dollars so it can deliver a better experience online. So my question is, what do you think is the top one to three challenges that, and I'm going to break this into two parts, that uh, schools and educational facilities have got in the next year or so? And part B is that parents have got in the next year or so. The two, three biggest challenges for schools and the two or three biggest challenges for parents in the coming years. Well, I think uh, if we talk about schools, um, schools will, will have a problem in the sense that um, parents will also be looking at this and saying, wait a minute, why, why am I paying all these fees for these kids when they're sat at home? Maybe I'll get a lower cost fee and my, my kid can stay at home and learn at home rather than going to school. Some parents might think that. Um, so schools have got to, when, when children are back in or students are back in school, school must not waste the face-to-face -face time. Meaning, don't deliver things kids can find on their phones in face-to-face -face time. It's pointless. That's just not education. They can go and get that anywhere. So That's you've right. got to think about what you're delivering and how you're delivering. So, so, so the, the issue more uh, now is not, not so much um, how, where, and when you deliver, but what you deliver. And what you deliver has to be relevant. So if you start having education systems that have no relevance to either the students or their future, then you're dead in the water. You know, if you're going to do the same old, same old, it's going to be a problem for you. And I think parents will now start looking around more and more. So schools are going to think about this situation. The second thing is, um, the challenge of schools is, if they don't get all their students back, what do they do? How do you, you know, how do they, in, to, to, to get this uh, number of students back? Because of course, they need students to pay the bills to cover the costs. So in, in our situation, uh, you know, we, we are doing more and more themed concepts. You know, our, our base platform is entrepreneurship. But we're also building brands, and this, was start, this started before the virus activity. We're also building brands around things like, uh, we're now going to build a brand that only focuses on entrepreneurship around environmental issues and sustainability. So the kids who go to that school in the morning, they won't do anything academic. They'll just do projects on environment and sustainability issues. That's what we we'll focus on all the time. In the afternoon, they'll do educational activities. So we're going to change the way kids learn. But their focus will be entrepreneurship built around environmental and sustainable activities, working with the community. So that's going to be a different. So we think about how to integrate education into community, into world problems, into things that are happening that are relevant to them in their lifetime, relevant to us right now in our lifetime. So school has to become relevant. That's the most important thing. If it's not relevant, Who's going to go? I, I love what you're saying. And, uh, and I think this is the, the same too for any speakers, coaches, consultants, trainers that are listening as well, um, is that if you're going to now turn up in future and just deliver what could information that can be delivered to people online, um, I don't think you're going to get very far. And I love the fact that you're looking at school as a truly interactive, but, and I use the word again, immersive process with real life problems. And I recall that, uh, you know, I'm going back six, seven years ago, uh, now maybe even eight years ago, uh, we used to run an event in Malaysia called uh, Rock Your Green Business. And that's something that, you know, teachers from your school used to come along to and work on green businesses over a three-day period. I think that's a fantastic thing. And uh, on the summit that you're listening to, folks, we've also got Matthias Gelber, um, the greenest man on the planet, uh, on the summit with some phenomenal insights as well on what's coming next. Uh, and I think that what you're saying here is going to lead to something else 
that um, I'm going to bring up from an education perspective. And I don't know what your experience was, but I'm interested in your input. When I went to school in my final year of school, I won the school prize for English literature. Now I am a writer, I've got numerous books out, but um, when I did the government exam at the end of the year, I failed. So how can I win the school prize in a good school and fail the government exam? So I went to my English literature teacher, and I was so upset, man. And I said to him, um, how did this happen? He said, Mike, the examiners that mark this are not looking for anybody to cognitively unpack the subject in the exam. They're looking for you to basically chant the answers that you were should have memorized and not use your own thoughts. And I'm thinking, well, that's stupid. So it's so fascinating because when I went to university later on, I did my university extramurally. I thought keeping that very clearly in my mind, I went to the head of department of every subject I was doing. And I said, I'm in a job. I've got no time. My only time to study is between four and five in the morning. And I want to get the best mark I can. What do I need to study in this big, thick series of books? And they said, well, Mike, don't study chapters two, seven, eight, nine, and 11, because we never examine you on that. Ch chapter three, we always examine you on. Chapter five and six are worthwhile. So I cut my study back. And guess what happened? The person who failed the government exam in English literature suddenly at university won two academic prizes for topping the country in strategic management and operational management. Not because I gave any of my own insights. In fact, because I chant memorized all the stuff that I had to do. And strangely enough, a friend of mine did exactly the same subject next year. And I offered her all my notes and uh, my study method. And she decided she would, because um, she's a great researcher, put her own opinions in. And guess what? She failed the subject. Now, what you guys are doing and what you are great at is allowing people to, again, I'll use that word, immerse, opinion, expand, push boundaries, upset, disrupt, whatever words you want to use. I think everybody on the call's got the idea. And is that where education needs to go for it to truly have purpose? Is that your well, thoughts? Well, the, the purpose of education used to be, Mike, if I can say it, used to be... Uh, to prepare students for the workforce, should we say. That's, that's probably a good description of it, right? So my view now of education, education is about preparing students for uncertainty and constant change. Mm. Now, if you're going to prepare somebody for uncertainty and constant change, if you sit them down to make an examination, I'm also helping them. Yep. And if you look, what, what, what are people looking for in the world today? They're not looking for, or, I mean, I'm not saying examinations will disappear. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying the sort of examinations we have today will probably disappear eventually. Assessments, evaluations, projects will take their place because what we need now is skills, not examination technique. The issue has been, you know, if I go back to my square again, the problem with the, with the education system is that it's built up around the focus point is examination. How, I mean, how do we measure success in, in education? Past examinations. The measure is the wrong measure. They're measuring the wrong thing. It's no longer relevant. Now, I can say that, I can give you an example, okay? Uh, you know, we have kids in our school. I can give an example of one kid who's 12 years old and he's built this complete hydroponic system where he, he grows kale, he markets it, he sells it, as he has a business plan for it, he has all these things with it, and parents buy it from, and he sells it outside the school as well. And he does also, he does biology, he does science, he does economics, he does all these things. But there's no certification for, hey, hydroponic guy, right? Yeah. So he fails all his examinations, he's a failure. And yet he's a super success. So we're measuring the wrong things. So, and what's interesting now is that because of this virus situation, the examination boards can't get kids together to examine them for the first time ever. So now they're having to do assessments. So teachers have to do assessments based on coursework or mock exams. And so they're, they're looking at things different. Now, that's a, that would be a real changer. That's a game changer. Because in my view, people in the workforce are not looking necessarily for examination qualifications anymore. They're looking for competencies. They're looking for skills. They're looking for problem-solving abilities. That's something that we're not measuring for today or even delivering. But we are. We're looking at those things. So my view is that 
The ideal, no, this is that we're in a world now of personalization. And yet everyone has to do the same examination. But what Good about, point. what about personalization of my academic achievement or my education achievement or my education experience? So if we start saying, well, wait a minute, rather than you actually doing these examinations, which we, you can do if you want to do, by the way, you can go on and do these at the same time, but we're also going to build competencies. We're going to build a series of competencies. I'm going to assess you in those competencies. So by the time you leave our education experience system, you have your own personal DNA of what you've done and how you've achieved those things, as opposed to you've got 28%, this guy's got 45%, he's better than you says who and that's what's going to change now the problem is that the whole um, shadow education marketplace today is built around this measurement system it's built around you know test prep extra work for passing examinations how to pass the examinations even apps how to pass examinations because that's the most important thing no it's not that's not the most important that's the measure which is no longer relevant Education is about people giving people the skill sets and behaviors to be successful in life. And that's going to change. So that's why this adaptive approach, this, this constant uncertainty and constant change is what we've got to be, we've got to educate for, not the square. The square's gone. The square's disappeared. We've got to think about what's going to happen in the future. And nobody knows. Nobody can tell you what the jobs will be in five years' time. Nobody knows. So how can you, how can you prepare people for that if you go the same old square route? You know, now if you think about education at home, you know, I've been thinking about, uh, we're gonna develop an online school, which will support our existing school, but it will be a virtual school online in the future. But if you think of things like, you know, 5G, what's happening with VR, AR, uh, technology around platforms, technology around blockchain, around uh, communications, around uh, communities, if you suddenly, deliver a kit to a kid and say, here's your skill kit. Inside there, you've got some VR goggles, you've got a whole bunch of other kit, and suddenly they can plug this on, they're in a classroom somewhere else. That's how education should go. It should go with the technology. It shouldn't be based on, you know, writing out and filling out these pieces of paper. We've passed that a long time ago, and yet we still do that. Now, the problem is, of course, we can't do that for everybody. But if we push the boundaries in one direction, it'll pull the other one up with it. But if yep. we just accept this normal way of educating and behaving, then nothing will change. And, and no, I'm saying that from a, from a function of, or let's say, a, an output of that system. My brother was an academic. My brother was really smart at school, really ex excellent. He's, he was older than me. So when I got to school, the teacher was, and we went to the same school. Ah, you're Teddy Patton's brother. So you would be great at maths, at science. I sucked. I didn't like the teachers. <laughs> But cause I, so, so I was uh, already labeled because I wasn't like him, but we're completely different people as every individual is, right? So this is why it, but the education system is still designed around this manufacturing process. Everyone's the same. We're completely different. We don't want a narrow set of skills. We want a broad set of skills. Absolutely. And I think, you know, we've got a, a time here where there's going to be a natural catch up as well, because, um, I love what you're saying, but I'm very privy to the way you've built your system over the last X number of years. And um, I've been on that journey with you. But when somebody comes out, pops out the other side of that journey and they're 21 or 22 years old, for example, um, and now they apply for a job, and I'm talking in, in 2025 or something, five years time, chances are the person who's interviewing for them for that job is 45 years old and went through the whole old system. So their mindset, unless they're conscious, which is one of the reasons we're doing a conscious leadership summit, unless that boss is conscious, that boss is going to maybe not take them seriously and maybe going to employ somebody who's got all the credentials, but in fact is not actually suited for the job because it, it's so funny. I mean, I love what you said about your brother. You reminded me that when I was at school, I didn't like my maths teacher. In fact, I threw fruit at him at the class and got suspended. But um, because of that, I failed maths. So I never had any, any later than year 10 maths. But during my corporate career, they used to call me the numbers guy because I could always do math in my head. But do I know, you know, 
calculus and engineering formulas? Hell no. Do I ever want to do trigonometry? I don't even know what it is. I don't know what the word is. But if you can ask me any maths equation that's, that's got to do with business or numbers or anything that we use in our day-to-day -day lives, I'm quicker than anybody. So, so what do we do to educate the other side of this, which is, which is educating business on the new type of uh, graduate, I guess? Is that something you guys have thought about? Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's why we're, we're also moving into our own academy. Um, I mean, ki kids will come through our system and they'll have two routes, basically. They can go what I would call traditional education, and they can go off to do A-level and go into university, or they can go in, into our academy, and then they're going to they're gonna go, they're gonna go into, into more of an entrepreneurial world. But that, that doesn't necessarily mean that our, all our students are going to be entrepreneurs. That's not our focus. I would say there are four... I would say there's four outputs from what we do in our systems. Creatives, uh, freelancers, entrepreneurs, and entrepreneurs. I would say they're the areas that we focus on because we can't be everything to everyone. But I believe that those are the areas that are going to be growing in the future. Let's so unpack three, those for people who don't know what they are. So um, give me an example of a creative, an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur, and the other ones you said? Uh, freelancers. Right. So sing, right, people doing their own business, uh, but an individual doing it. Well, cre creatives, you know, we, in our school, we, you know, we, do, we do things like, uh, an example would be hip hop's compulsory, okay? And we do hip hop right. not because we want all the kids to be great dancers. It's just that hip hop is a way of also making you feel more confident about yourself, making you feel more part of something, making you feel part of it, because all kids do it. And, there's, and nobody gets, you know, everyone claps every way. Ah, oh, fantastic, fantastic. So you, your self-esteem is built up. So it's used as a way to build self-esteem. At the same time, we have some of the best hip hop dancers all over Malaysia. So, right. you know, it's happened this way. Now, the guy who was the original hip hop uh, teacher now has hip hop businesses. So he's, he's a creative, he's created a business, right? That's kind of a, a concept there. We have sure. guys who are working with us who are fashion designers for some of the top people uh, in the music industry in the US. They come and work with us as well. So the kids do fashion design. Um, so we're doing all these different art things. You no, know, it's, it's like you, you mix art and science or you mix different things together. You don't just do it in, in silos. You just roll them over into it and just see what happens. So this is kind of what we try to do more and more because that's the real world. So, so creatives can be anything. Um, freelancers are, are kids who will learn different skill sets. So in our schools, uh, we start from primary, all kids learn digital skills. We have a special digital curriculum that we'd be working with a, with a partner with that we put in there. So all the kids that come out of our schools can do coding, can build websites, can do online platforms. Can, it's, it's, I would call, it's like the, the basics. You know, when I was at school, I had to learn maths and science. They have to learn digital skills. It's a requirement just to get a job. So that's not taught today in any formal way. All our kids will do digital skills. That's a platform for them. Uh, so mo many of them might end up being freelancers, you know, so, so they would have virtual companies. So they come together with three or four people, solve a problem, break up, come together. So it's the way it's working now with the gig economy. So we talk Absolutely. in those sort of terms, right? An entrepreneur is somebody who has all the entrepreneurial mindset and drive, but doesn't want the risk of doing their own company, wants to work in a big team. So they take those skill sets with them into an organization. And they can be a really strong, effective member of our organization. And we have many of those guys who come from our school as well. And then we have the actual entrepreneurs who want to go and start their own thing, start their own business, make a difference, do something that they're passionate about. And we also have those people. Now, when you mix all those together, you get a tremendous atmosphere happening all the time. You know, it's a very creative environment. It's, very, it's a very uh, collaborative environment. And I would say probably our... Our school is one of the only ones I've ever been to where I see teenagers, boys and girls mixing in a very easy way, presenting things together, working together in groups. There's no like, you know, guys are over there and go, there's none of that takes place because it's the way they've come through the system. Because we also talk about values, you know, the importance of giving back, the importance in society, all these things that you do from a very early age. And that's why I think we can, you know, we can do those different things. <clears throat> you, guys, um, you guys teach mindset, you teach networking, yeah. you teach entrepreneurship, you teach financial literacy, you teach all of the things that I wish I had have learned to, at school. So, um, and I've experienced not only in a, in a school situation um, where you see 
with you guys, the, the teenagers, male and female coming together and, you know, just acting as if there's no diversity whatsoever. But I, I see 15 year olds helping eight year olds yeah. um, through your process, which never yeah. happened. When I went to school, if you were 15, you'd never talk to an eight year old. But at your schools, you know, people, the age difference, the age barrier is not there. And that's why those kids sat next to you in the canteen all those years yep. ago as well. Um, yep. Let me just segue for, for a bit in uh, for the last 10 minutes, we're going to chat and say, um, I've had a lot of concern from, from our clients around the world who are coaches, trainers, speakers, consultants, etc., about now all the free education online. And I know that they're talking about, you know, their training course on customer service or, um, you know, selling or whatever they're doing. And there's a whole bunch of free stuff online. Um, there's a lot of people saying education should now be free because there is this online thing. I have, a, I have my own opinions on that. Um, and I'll, I'm happy to share those, but I'm really interested to see um, because there's going to be a, a price um, squeeze come on education during this time, for sure. You're already experiencing it where parents are going, well, my kids aren't going to school, so what am I paying for? Hello, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Um, we're not running a creche. This is not a baby minding center. Uh, uh, uh. You're not paying to have your children minded. You're having paying to have your children educated. So, but... Um, but I'm interested to see what you think is going to happen and what you guys are planning to do to um, really pivot against, uh, against what will be a growing trend, not only for consultants, but in traditional education as well. Well, one of the things that, uh, that I was involved with was um, when I first got into ed tech, um, one of the first questions I, I asked myself was, um, I can, you know, I can, uh, I can take a, a game uh, from a mobile phone, you know, so if, if I want to, I can download a game, I can put it on my phone, and I can be entertained. And that's great, and I'm paying to be entertained. But if I'm downloading um, an educational product, how do I know I'm being educated? I'm not just entertained. How do I differentiate between those two things? Yep. So, so on, from the base of that, we, in our education side, we set up, in Finland, we set up a a company to do assessments, to, to, assess, to assess the pedagogy quality of what it is you are delivering. Because there's a lot of trash out there. And the problem is if, if you're trying to completely trash, it's very difficult because the consumer doesn't know what's good or what's bad. So, so the only way to do that, or the only way we found to do that, was to create some sort of a de facto standard. And this standard will go into your product and it would identify the goods, you know, what, how you're doing it, what you're doing it, and does that meet uh, research based uh, information and that's how we did it so we, we created this company at that time is called Kokoa it's now called uh, Education Alliance Finland and we set that company up to do evaluations and that was for our own internal use but today we've done evaluations in 26 countries in the world because people want want to have some badge that says yep. yes they have all these but I have this badge and this badge tells me that my product's better than yours and it's been certified by somebody who, who, you know, who is the third party. So you have to find a way to give credibility to what it is you're doing. And you have to find a way to say, I have research behind this. This isn't just like I pulled it out of the air. I've, I've been doing this for 10 years. Here's my proof. Here's my stats. Here's my statistics. Here's my information that makes me different to anybody else. If you don't mm. do that, it's hard to differentiate. Yeah, I, I very much agree. Uh, my, my view, which is in my new book, Conscious Leadership, is I use the example of I want to bake a chocolate cake. So I go to Google. There are 758,000 recipes. So naturally I click on the first one. It tells me I've got to put in 250 grams of sugar. I don't know how much that is. Is that good or bad? So I check it. I click on the second one. That says 125 grams of sugar. That's going to be better. But is it, what is it still right? Um, hang on, let me just try a third one. Now this one says two cups of sugar. Now I'm totally confused. What is it right or wrong? So I go, what am I going to do? And I think, well, I know what I'm going to do. I like Gordon Ramsay. He's not going to lead me astray. So I'll go and see what he does. And then I just copy his recipe and voila, there's my chocolate cake. The point being that more so than ever in a world that's inundated with free crap, we are going to look for trusted advisors, people that we truly trust, people who have 
done the yards, got the certifications, built the ecosystems, been on the journey a long time and really understand their stuff. And I think for anybody educational in the education system or in the um, other education system, you know, for uh, post learning, I think this is the brand and marketing and positioning is probably going to be more important than it ever was. Stuart, just one last question for you. And um, what would be one or two tips that you could give to parents out there who are nervous about what the world's going to look like from their children's point of view in the next year from somebody who is responsible for educating thousands of children along with your team at Ace Adventure? Well, I, I don't think, you know, it comes back to the same, my, my same uh, principle is that we, we, have to, we have to prepare children for uh, uncertainty and constant change. And that means we've got to do things like, you know, help them learn how to, to develop resilience, uh, you know, how, how to be, think creatively, think in different ways. We can't just focus on examinations and say they're going to be okay if they pass examinations. That's not going to fly anymore in the future. We've got to, we've got to build into them, if possible, a joy and a love of learning and self-development and continuous growth. And that's more than just education. That's more like a holistic approach. If we do that, then we'll start making global citizens and they'll have much more of a different reach in the future, different view in the future. So although the future is unknown and uncertain, that's a good place to be because when it's unknown and uncertain, we do creative things. If it's certain, we don't do much at all. So the more it's uncertain and the more it's, it's, it's constant change, the more innovative we are to, to deal with those situations in the future. That's fantastic advice. I love it. What a great place to finish. Stuart, I always get excited when I talk to either yourself or Anne about, um, about the future. And, and it's so, I, I really hope people, you know, listen through this because they'll get excited about the future. And so many people are living in fear and guilt at the moment and uncertainty because of the situation going on. Um, I know people who are listening to this that are parents or um, have got kids at different levels of school um, you know, we'll want to find out more about the virtual school when that opens up, because I know that's something you guys have been working on long before coronavirus came on board and other things. Is the best way to connect with you through your LinkedIn um, and catch up with you there? We'll definitely put that on your on your site, or is there another way uh, people could connect you can, with you? You can do it through LinkedIn, but my LinkedIn will still not, it hasn't got, I don't think LinkedIn yet has got my uh, ACE situation. That's my lack of poor marketing there, doing other things. But if you want to, they can, you know, I'm happy if you want to send a direct me to email. You can use my email if you have my email, Mike, yeah? Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, I can, I can put that up on the site as well. You can share Stuart, as well, it's no problem. It's been great talking to you and, uh, and I love what you guys are doing and thanks so much for, for being on our call today. Oh, my pleasure, Mike. Always great to speak to you.